Hey guys, it's just me and Alicia hanging out here at one of our favorite coffee shops, kind of just leading our hearts towards the Lord, planning and dreaming for what's to come, and uh, it's just kind of where we're at in life and what we're doing. So, if you look for a place like this, a dream, where you can know, get out of your house, change environments, go somewhere that can kind of inspire you, have some good coffee, and spend some good time together. Now today's video, I got some really uh, cool stuff I want to dive into, another Bible Secrets video. So check this out. Well, I tried once, didn't quite work. Let me try again. Here it goes. Uh, I can do a voiceover. And boom, the grass is cut. Now, this is gonna be an illustration for what I'm talking about today. So here I am, getting set. You guys hang out, grab some coffee, and uh, let's dive into this thing and learn about our heavenly realities. The Book of Romans is kind of like this crazy dichotomy of what it means to live in Christ and what it means to live outside of Christ. And then Paul adds in how the law factors into that and what this new faith walk looks like when you, when you consider the law, because the book of Romans was written to Jews who were living in Rome, and how that applies to the new walk of faith. Let me go grab it. So, if I can be honest, Romans is a book that used to kind of scare me. When I first started my walk with Jesus, I poured through it. You know, the Romans road to salvation. And I just devoured everything in there. In fact, Romans 6.23 was my favorite verse. It said, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that was really important to me. I'd just given my life to Jesus. I knew, I knew the wages of sin were, were leading me down a road that was not fulfilling, much less a road that wasn't leading to eternal bliss and heavenly glory in the presence of God. It was, it was a road that, that ends in death, a road that ends in a place that is staggeringly excruciating. It's a place that Jesus even describes as, as Gehenna, a, 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 a garbage dump that burns day and night. We're not trash, but in order to see that we're not trash, we have to see ourselves from God's perspective. We're not destined to end up in garbage dumps to, to continually burn like the, the leftover twigs, the leftover, the leftover part of the crop that didn't grow and didn't bear fruit. No, no, the fact is, the reality is, is that we're God's kids. <laughs> we're his sons and daughters. We're heirs to everything in the palace, every good thing that comes down from heaven from the Father of lights. And that's the reality that we live in, and I believe that's the reality. That's the picture that Paul is painting. He's, he's, look, look, look right here. Two realities. Now that's me observing the text. Like Romans is a mystery. Like I just even tried to like win this six this six volume commentary on Romans that I saw on Instagram. Like, and I've got a commentary on it somewhere, but it's packed up. I poured through the commentaries in the past, and you know, a lot of them are good. They're they're well intentioned, but they have this like linear mindset as as they go through the book. And you know, here's what you do, and here's what you don't do. Here's what you do. Here's good and evil. Good and evil. And, and if you haven't watched my good and evil video, the knowledge of good, of good and evil and how we can kind of live in those two paradigms, go check it out. But that became a foundation for my new understanding of Romans because he goes from sin to righteousness several, several times in the beginning of the book. And then he kind of expounds that world later in the book. L listen to this. For God in heaven unveils his holy anger, breaking forth against every form of sin, both toward ungodliness that lives in hearts and evil actions. Now, what is that? What is sin? Well, sin is anything that begins or ends outside the image of God. Sin is anything that doesn't have its origin in God. It says his heart burns in anger towards sin, every form of sin, and ungodliness that lives in the hearts. He didn't say it was against people. He was saying it was against this world system, this other reality that presented itself that people find themselves stuck in and in bondage in. And then he goes on to say, what was the purpose of the law? Well, the law reveals, all right, check this out. I'm going to read it to you. Like right here. Again, two realities. So you got this paragraph up here that's reality two, the false reality. You got this paragraph down here that's the original reality. Now listen to this. 
Now we realize that everything the law says is addressed to those who are under its authority. This is for two reasons. So that every excuse will be silenced with no boasting of innocence and so that the entire world would be held accountable to God's standards. The, God, the law revealed the standards of God. For by the merit of observing the law, no one earns the status of being declared righteous before God. For it is the law that fully exposes and unmasks the reality of sin. So the law is there and it shows us the things that are outside of his image. But now independently of the law, the righteousness of God is tangible. This is the other reality. Tangible means that you can grab it. It's apprehendable. It's right there. And brought to light through Jesus, the anointed one. This is the righteousness that scriptures prophesied would come. It is God's righteousness made visible through faithfulness in Jesus Christ. And now all who believe in him will receive that gift. For there really is no difference between us. For we have all sinned and are in need of the glory of God. Yet through the powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives away his righteousness. So he's saying, look, the law is there. It shows his standards, but no one has attained that except for Jesus. You can't go through the law and get to Jesus. You can't go through the law and get to the Lord. After all of that, the one who, the one who was able to fulfill the law has freely given us his righteousness. He goes on to say this is faith in him that apprehends the reality, the original reality, the original design, the righteous design that begins and concludes in the image of God. His gift of love and favor now cascades over us all because Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated from the guilt, punishment, and the power of sin. So that's the entrance, that's the restoration to the reality. The sin reality, and then you have the righteous reality. How do you apprehend the righteous reality? Through faith in Jesus. He's the one who came in the image of God. He is the image. So if you see him, you'll be like him. If you see Jesus that ignites the faith in our hearts to come to the Father. So it's this family thing. Father loving Son, Son loving Spirit, Spirit loving Father. And then you add us into the next. Father loving Son, Son loving Bride, Bride loving Spirit, Spirit loving Father. And it completes the family cycle. You know, another verse that really illustrates this is in John. Let me find it. John 16, 8 says this. When he comes, Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. So if we take everything we just learned from Romans and understand that that is actually built upon this verse, we can look at this verse and kind of break it down. Let's do that real quick. So if we break down sin, righteousness, and judgment, let's define each one of these. So sin, outside, his image, or an earthbound reality. Righteousness is inside his image, or heavenly reality. So what is judgment? How does that play into sin and righteousness? Well, it reveals which reality we're living in. Now it says at the outset of this verse, the Holy Spirit will convict. That's a heavy word, like you hear it all the time in Christian circles. Convicted of sin, convincing. Like what is that? So conviction does something to our hearts. Judgment, right and wrong. It differentiates which reality we live in. So what is the role of conviction? You see that? So conviction pulls us from living in this reality to living in this reality. It pulls us from earthbound thinking to heavenly thinking. It helps us remember who we are and whose we are. When the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts, He's resetting us and reorienting us to live from heavenly places. It's easy as we go throughout our day to make these random adjustments to where something influences us here from the lower reality, something influences us here from the lower reality. All of a sudden we begin to think and act according to that reality. When we begin to think and act according to that reality, we feel this deficit inside of us because we haven't been doing good. The good in our lives gets pushed down. The evil in our lives kind of is, is on us. And some people call that conviction. Remembering the evil that you've done isn't conviction, right? Conviction is saying, leave that reality and return to the righteous reality. Leif calls it sitting in one or chair two. In my other video, Living from Good and Evil, I call it from living from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil or living from the knowledge of the tree of life. Living from your origin or living from the fall. How are we going to live our lives? And when you go through Romans and the rest of the book, he said, don't use your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness, but as members of righteousness. Don't use your arms and your legs 
Don't use your bodies themselves to do things that are outside of God's image. Use them to do things that are inside of God's image. If you find yourself doing something outside of God's image, like Paul illustrates, sometimes I'm doing the very things that I don't want to do. He has to reset and reorient and remember that he's living by faith in Jesus and that pulls him out of this low reality into a higher reality. So if we read this through a linear context, it doesn't make sense because is Paul saved or not? Are we saved or not? Because we base what we do on whether or not it's good or evil. Are we in this category or are we in this category? Well, that's the category of the law because the law says no one's righteous, no, not even one. But when Jesus comes, he says, here, here's my righteousness. I'm going to pour my righteousness out on you, out of the veins of my blood, out of my body, and that's going to make you righteous. Remembering that, and a lot of people say that righteousness is right standing with God, but remembering your remembering his righteousness transforms the way we think and allows us to perceive that his righteousness has become our own righteousness. It keeps us in his image. And the pull and the allure of things outside of his image, they, they, we don't have an appetite for those things. So what is the role of conviction? The conviction of the Spirit pulls us from here, causes us to ascend into the higher reality. Conviction allows us to actually ascend in thought and in mind, ascend in our hearts and ascend in our actions. That's a metanoia. That's thinking from above, not thinking from below. The error with Nicodemus is that when he went to Jesus, you know, he said, we know you're from God, but we're stuck down here. We don't know how to differentiate the gap. So Nicodemus is hanging out here and he's trying to figure out how Jesus is here. But Jesus said, actually, you know, I'm in heaven and earth at the same time, right? When we ascend in this reality and we have this righteousness, this righteousness begins to flood the earth through our lives. It's the same thing that happened with Jesus. So you see the separation disappear. You see sin disappear. You see the false reality disappear. As we become righteous, we preach the gospel, the good news. That's the way of the kingdom, right? Jesus was explaining this to Nicodemus. And he says, you know, you've got to be born in this reality if you want to see and apprehend this reality. The only way to be born into this reality, to be born from above, is through a relationship with Jesus. So the way to do it was the interaction that Nicodemus was having, but he misunderstood what Jesus said and said, how can we be born again on the earth? So Nicodemus thought that it meant being reborn here with a heavenly idea. And so, but that's what the law tries to say. Like the law reveals that this exists. So Nicodemus knew that Jesus was from God, but he came to him with a law mentality. Jesus is basically saying you can't apprehend anything I'm saying with the law mentality. It's only through the relationship with me or is the ascension into a, the heavenly reality or otherwise being born again in this reality. So guys, you know, conviction is not something we should fear. You know, conviction is not a dirty word in the grace camp or any other camp that there is. Conviction is this powerful, wonderful, beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit does, the works that He administers in our lives so that righteousness is alive and inside of us. So when we have those mental shifts where we think from here rather than thinking from here, we're thinking from below rather than thinking from above, Holy Spirit usually, for me, it's a gentle whisper, hey, don't think that way. Hey, I love that person, you should love them too. Hey, that person doesn't know what they're doing. They didn't intend to hurt you in that way. So it's this constant thing to where we're being nurtured into the likeness of Christ. You guys like my cut yard? That's kind of like what I was talking about between sin and righteousness. If those thoughts grow up, like weeds grow up in our mind, judgment kind of lets us know it's there. Hey, hey, there's something inside of your your spirit that's that's not doesn't have its origin in me. Let's go ahead and remove that and let's return to the reality that you're created to live in. Let's return to fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the power of conviction. Hey, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. If you're liking these videos, see you guys.